At an early age, that's all I really could remember was uh, fighting uh, my father, beating my mother, and from early, as early as I can remember, all the way till the age of 10. That's when we ran, um, and we ended up in, in D.C. at a shelter called the House of Ruth. We were actually in hiding there for a while um, until I turned 14. They ended up going to court so he could get visitation, and we started to go visit my father again. He was a horrible husband, but he was a great father. And that was the painful part because I was daddy's little girl. And to have to deal with him beating my mother and feel like I was, you know, not choosing sides, but it just, it was just, it was crazy. I remember being as young as five and being um, molested by several family members. I was home from school with a family member and that family member told me that they were having company for me to answer the door. And I was sitting watching the Flintstones and the person knocked on the door and I answered it. My family member was in the back in another room and um, I told them that their company was there. I let them in, they had a seat. I went back to watching TV and a few minutes later that person got up and approached me and ripped my shorts off and brutally raped me. Um, he raped me so badly I was bleeding and I never, I just cleaned myself up and I never told anyone because I didn't want that family member to get into trouble. I was, you know, I was just afraid. At that time the rape affected my frame of mind tremendously. I was not able to focus in school. I, I was getting horrible grades. I actually, to be totally honest with you, has started wetting the bed and everything. I mean, it, and it was just like, um, it was traumatizing. It was really traumatizing. At the time when I went to visit my father for um, our, my first actual visitation after we were taken from him, uh, we left him. I was excited because I finally got to see my dad. The young lady that he was dating had four kids. Uh, one was much older than I was and I had never met him, but I would speak to him when I would call. Sometimes he would be there. One particular evening when my dad went out with his girlfriend, I'm assuming that the younger son, because he slept in the living room, let him in, the brother, the older brother. He came into the room and he climbed into the bed with me. I was on the bottom bunk. His two sisters were on the top bunk. And he raped me. And after he raped me, he told me, and you better not tell your dad because he's gonna go to jail. His sisters were there the whole time while this was going on. And once he got done and he left, the older sister climbed down into the bed with me and she was comforting me. And she said to me, um, don't feel bad because this is, that's been happening to me all my life. At that point, I was just like a mess. I was, all these things had already happened to me and I was paranoid. And then when I um, eventually started to go out, it changed my whole mentality. I was this sweet young lady. And then I started to turn into somebody that I didn't even recognize. I started wearing tight clothing. I started becoming promiscuous. I was looking for attention still. And I wasn't, I, I didn't really trust people. So I was kind of leery, but at the same time, I somewhat really didn't care. I know that sounds, you know, I, I, I just had this attitude like, nobody else cares about me, so why should I? care about myself. I was still looking for love, looking for somebody to, to love me the way my daddy did. I had met this young man and he was handsome. Actually, when I met him, he was playing with a little white puppy. And you know, he was really nice, smelled good, looked good, everything. And we exchanged numbers and we started talking. That situation moved really quick. We started dating 
And we got serious, or what I thought was serious, within a two month period. And in that two month period, I started noticing changes in that person. The verbal abuse started, the mental abuse started. He would say things like, nobody cares about you but me. You see, it's nobody else here but me. So obviously they don't care, only I care. And if someone tells you that enough, then you really start to believe it. And that's where I was. He started becoming possessive and controlling. He started to tell me what to wear, what not to wear, where I could go, where I couldn't go. He isolated me. When I looked around, there was nobody there. I told him I wanted to go to the store and he was like, okay, go ahead and come right back. I was shocked because normally that didn't happen. He would go with me. I went to the store, I came back 15, 20 minutes tops. I knocked on the door, the apartment where he lived. At the time he lived there with his sister, brother-in-law and their twins who were five. And he opened the door. Immediately when he opened the door, he grabbed me by my hair and he drugged me by my hair past his sister their kids and, their, and, her, and his brother-in-law back to the room where he slept, and he began to beat me. And he beat me bloody. He um, then, after he finished beating me, kicking me and everything, he picked me up by my hair again, and he stood me up, and he like turned me around to him, and he said, you know you're not leaving me, right? And I was afraid of him, so I said no. And then he said, um, Good, because if you do, this is what's gonna happen. And he put a gun to my head and he pulled the trigger. And he made that a regular routine, Russian roulette, to keep me in fear and it worked. I was so afraid of this man. Because of everything that happened to me in my past, so my faith was very little, but with what little faith I had, I just prayed that God would get me out of that situation. And he did. Um, two of my cousins just popped up to check on me. I, um, I happened to be looking out of his window, just, just clearing out of his window. I didn't say anything to him because he's in the bathroom and I said, um, I'm gonna run to my apartment and I'll be right back. And again, he said, go ahead and come right back. So I literally ran like a freed slave and I ran for my life. Um, and I didn't look back. Uh, but when I left, I didn't leave alone. Eventually I found out I was pregnant by my abuser. I now have a 23 year old daughter by him. And I also left with uh, grandma's seizures. Today I still suffer from epilepsy due to severe blows to my head because of my abuser. But I'm alive, so. One particular morning, um, I was just so full. I, I felt like I had to speak out and say something or else I was gonna explode. So I just got up and I had a Facebook page already, but I, I never knew anything about a group or anything. So I just got up and made a group. Um, it's called Domestic Violence, Love Don't Hurt. And I shared my story on that group. People that I've known for years started sharing their stories with me. And other people were like, I have a story, but I'm not ready to share it. But thank you for the platform when I'm ready. At least I have somewhere to come to. It's the reason I'm still walking this walk now. It is part of my healing. It's not easy for us as, as, as advocates of domestic violence and sexual assault to do this. You know, it's not a lot of kumbaya moments, you know, which you would think. It's not, it's rough, it's hard, but every time I speak out, I'm not only speaking for myself, I'm speaking for my cousin that was murdered, shot three times and bludgeoned to death. I'm speaking for my mother who was silent who was beaten for 17 years, and anyone else that lost their life to domestic violence, I'm their voice. Renee Michelle is now a survivor, a striver, and an author, an actress, a speaker, 
a mother, a wife, and she's a friend to herself, something that she never was. I hated myself and I love myself so much now.